so fine with me i'm ready yeah okay Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, maybe some of you are in time zone where it is good morning or even good night. Uh, wherever you are, a very warm welcome to the series to celebrate the 50th publication year of the classic A Theory of Justice by John Rawls. Uh, we are very pleased that uh, in the introductory lecture we have Professor Thomas Proge was kindly agreed, and he is at the early morning uh, sitting in uh, US to speak to us and to take us through both the developments on the theory of justice as well as its practical impact on the question of health uh, equity. Uh, Professor Proge does not need a long introduction. Uh, the very fact that a lot of you have gathered here indicates that you know his work and you're familiar with uh, the uh, significant uh, intervention that he has done in the field of health policies. Yet what is important for us is uh, how close he was with John Rawls to get trained for his doctoral dissertation with him. During the lecture, Professor Poke has agreed he will take us through his own interaction with John Rawls and his uh, discussion on the question of global justice with Professor Rawls, and later to take us through the intervention on health equity. A couple of other things apart from being a professor of philosophy at Yale University. Professor Boge is also quite well known for the Health Impact Fund, as well as the movement of academics standing against poverty. These are the interventions where Professor Boge has stepped out of typical academic world to human interventions and to show the real impact of the theory of justice. We are very pleased to welcome you to this series and very thankful to you for inaugurating this series. Now over to you, Professor uh, Poge. Before you begin, let me a, a word of caution to all the participants. We have a large number of participants in this series. Uh, it may not be possible to take all the questions through the discussion after this lecture. Uh, therefore, the request is to use the chat box to type out your questions so that we could address them in a systematic uh, fashion. Maybe at some point there is an opportunity for a few of you to speak up and raise questions, but be very precise in the questions that you raise so that uh, we could take as many questions as possible. And uh, now over to Professor Poge to for this lecture. Good, thank you very much, Sony, and good afternoon to you all. Here we have a beautiful morning. Uh, it's about 7.30 in the morning in the United States, in New Haven to be exact, which is about 80 miles northeast of New York. So John Rawls was my teacher. I will start with a few remarks about what made him original, what was really important about his work. I will then talk about global justice a little bit and about 
the concrete proposal of a health impact fund that I have developed very much inspired by John Rawls, even though I'm not sure that he would have approved of such an idea, but we will see about that. So start with the idea that there are two different perspectives on social explanations. So when we look at the world and we see things happening, we can explain them in two very different ways. We can, on the one hand, explain token events, individual events by referring to the conduct of agents. So I call that interactional causal analysis. So we find, let's say that a person is poor or that a person has committed suicide and we ask ourselves, why did that happen? And we trace it back to the conduct of other people. This person didn't give him a job. This person uh, humiliated her in some way. And so we have micro explanations of particular salient events in the world. Another kind of explanation is where we explain the incidence and distribution of events, maybe the trend that more and more of such events happen. So here we focus on event types and we explain them by reference to social rules, practices, procedures, customs. This is something that I call institutional causal analysis. So instead of explaining why a particular person is poor, we explain why there is more poverty in one Indian province than another, or we explain why there is a higher suicide rate in South Korea than in India. So these are macro explanations that were pioneered in particular in the 19th century by thinkers such as Marx, Durkheim, Weber, and so on. So Rawls based his approach on this distinction. He said, this distinction is very significant also from a moral point of view. And we have to engage in not only moral analysis of individual events and say, what is the moral responsibility of particular agents for a particular token event, but we must also engage in moral analysis of rates of incidence, of uh, poverty, of violence, and so on. Explain that in terms of the way we have structured our social systems, in terms of the institutional arrangements that we have made. Now, these two modes of explanation are not reducible to one another. So even if you have explained every single token suicide, you have not necessarily explained the suicide rate and differences in the suicide rate or trends in the suicide rate. Uh, and conversely, even if you have explained a trend in the suicide rate or in the poverty rate, why poverty has gone up in India or gone down, you haven't yet explained why these particular people were falling into poverty. So the two explanations are both necessary to get a full picture. And of course, they are compatible with each other, both causally and also morally. By compatible, I mean you can hold an individual person responsible, let's say, for the poverty of another person. And you can at the same time hold institutional arrangements responsible for the poverty rate or for changes in that poverty rate. So we get then corresponding to the two types of explanation, social explanation, we get two uh, areas of morality, two things that we are morally uh, analyzing and assessing Namely, on the one hand, we get ethics, which evaluates agents and their conduct. On the other hand, we get social justice, which evaluates institutional designs.
ways of organizing a social system, for example, a national society. And Rawls was really the pioneer. This was in Europe, this was a common mode of thinking, but Rawls brought that to the United States. And he analyzed the way in which institutions are organized against the background of the prevalence of these ordinary interactional explanations. So before Rawls came along, it was all too common for Americans to think in terms of interactional explanations. People would say, well, yes, there are poor people in our country and they are poor because they didn't work hard enough. America is the land of opportunity. You know, they didn't work hard enough or maybe they had bad luck or maybe they were a victim of a crime. But people didn't think in a systematic way about the way their society was organized and did not uh, provide macro explanations and in particular uh, moral assessments of their own institutional arrangements. So Rawls brings to the foreground this topic of social justice. He claims that the distribution of human life prospects is strongly affected by the way a society is organized, by its basic rules and procedures, customs and practices, or as you might say, by its institutional order, or in Rawls's favorite term, by its basic structure. So he makes the basic structure of society a key topic of moral reflection. The great merit of Rawls's theorizing is this important focus on a new judicandum, for America at least, a new judicandum, uh, something to be assessed, namely the basic rules of a society, uh, the basic structure. And in the Anglophone world, at least, uh, he pioneered the current understanding of social justice as focusing on institutional, causal, and moral analysis. And here I should add that in his particular moral analysis, there are two things that stand out. He has a very strong focus on individual freedom or basic liberties, as he calls it. So he says that a very important criterion by which we assess how just a particular way of organizing society is, is by looking at how much freedom people enjoy. And a second point that is very typical for Rawls and specific to his way of moral theorizing is his focus on the worst off, on the least advantaged people in a society. Rawls is essentially saying, show me the worst of people in your society and how much worse off they are than might otherwise be possible through a better organization of institutions. And I will tell you how well your society is doing in moral terms. So the focus, his moral focus, is on freedom and the worst off. Now, one great disappointment for me and the subject of many, many conversations that I had with him all the way until the last years of his life, when he was already suffering from the effects of a stroke, or several strokes, I should say, in 1995, which he had had. One thing that we debated again and again and again was the application of his mode of institutional moral analysis to the world at large. I was arguing that the world also has a basic structure. The world also has a system of basic rules, procedures, processes, customs, and that this institutional order of the world, epitomized by the new WTO, which came into existence in 1995, but also exemplified by the United Nations system, by the World Bank, by the IMF, and so on, 
that this institutional order of the world should be analyzed in exactly the same way in which Rawls had analyzed the institutional order of his own society. And this was something that Rawls did not agree with. So Rawls did in the end write, partly I think under pressure from our discussions, he did turn in the last years of his life to the topic of international relations, but he wrote a book that doesn't really apply inter, uh, institutional moral analysis, but rather focuses on interactional moral analysis. So the book called The Law of Peoples is a book about the good behavior of states, how, or he calls them peoples, how peoples should behave toward one another. And it doesn't really address the institutional order under which these peoples, peoples coexist. I think Rawls would have said, there is not really any basic structure, at least there is not yet a basic structure that is fit for institutional moral analysis. So uh, I then disagreeing with Rawls on that point, I then worked on uh, extending institutional moral analysis to the supranational institutional order. And I started with a very thin conception of justice for the international domain, a conception of justice that basically just says that we should judge an international institutional order by the extent to which human beings of the present and future generation have the essentials of a worthwhile life and take uh, and have their basic needs and interests fulfilled. So a very uh, rudimentary conception of global justice, we want the international institutional order to be designed so that as far as possible, people's basic human needs are met. One can formulate that in terms of basic or true human needs, a concept that Marx would have used. One can talk about capabilities with Amartya Sen. One can talk about basic liberties, basic freedoms as Rawls would have preferred. And one can talk about human rights, of course. So, but in all these different languages, you can make the same basic demand or you can postulate the same basic standard of social justice. You can say that we want to assess our international institutional order by the extent to which it fulfills all human needs, the human needs of all human beings all across the globes, to the extent to which it fulfills human rights, realizes human rights. This is not a full criterion of social justice for the international sphere, but it is a core criterion. It singles out something that is the most important standard, the most important criterion for judging how well our world is doing. Now, uh, applying this sort of moral institutional analysis, you find that our global institutional order is defective in many different ways. And pretty much all my work subsequent to this discussion with Rawls has focused on different aspects of our supranational institutional order on the main defects that prevent this order from fulfilling the human rights of all, from, from meeting the human needs of all people. And I won't go into these examples, but these are uh, six different aspects of our global institutional order that systematically obstruct the fulfillment of human rights. I will simply now pick out one of these aspects and analyze it in some detail so that you get an example 
of how our supranational institutional order is defective by this very simple criterion of uh, global justice and also how it might be reformed in order to make it more just. The second is a very important aspect of such an analysis because you cannot say that a particular institutional order is unjust or defective unless you can show how it might be reformed to make it better so that more people can have their human rights satisfied, more human needs can be met. So let us focus on this area of pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals, before we, obviously, okay. yeah. before we proceed, there is a question on the conceptual issues. Would you like to look at the chat box? Yeah, if I can get to it. Um, let me see where the, it is. Yeah. Good. Kant's deontology, that question? Yes. Okay. I read the question for everybody. Kant's deontology is on the lines that moral worth of my action consists not in the consequences that flow from it, but in the intention from which an act is done. Morality is about respecting person as ends in themselves. What would be Rawls's view on that? So this whole point is a point about ethics, right? When we talk about justice, we are our judicandum, what we are evaluating or assessing is institutions, that is to say rules, rules, practices, procedures, and they don't have any intentions. Rules are just social constructs. And so here, this distinction of deontology and consequentialism that you provide uh, does not have any foothold. The distinction does apply, of course, to ethics where we analyze the conduct of persons and we analyze their moral character, the personality of people. <clears throat> but uh, here, uh, this point is really beside the point because we are completely in the justice domain and not in the ethics domain. Now, here's another question. If you share some reflection on the comparison between Rawls's theory of justice and improvement based justice theories, such as the capabilities approach. <clears throat> so I don't think there is a distinction there. This, there's different language, but much of that debate is a bit of a pseudo debate because Rawls would exactly like Sen would say <clears throat> that we should think of justice as a scale, as a spectrum, and we should try to get as close to a just arrangement of institutions as possible. So I think that Sen is exaggerating when he says, uh, when he accuses Rawls of being focused only on the best achievable. Of course, there is something that is best achievable, but for Rawls, just as for Sen, that is identified by a scale where you say there are different rankings, different qualities that you might distinguish. An institutional order can be better or worse. And we should aim to make our institutional order as just as possible on such a scale. Does Rawls's unwillingness to engage with the supranational institutional designs leave a huge gap in his theoretical engagement of justice on analyzing the severe inequalities left by globalization and also the increasing race inequalities worldwide? So I would say yes. I mean, that's exactly my point, and I'm trying to fill that gap. But uh, that would not be the answer Rawls would give. Rawls would say that global institutional arrangements are so thin that they don't really play a major role 
in explaining what happens in the world, including the morally salient phenomena. So Rawls would say, if people are avoidably poor or oppressed in the developing world today, then the basic causal explanation for that is injustice in their own country. The international institutional rules have little or nothing to do with it. They don't have much of a causal role. That is wrong. Rawls is wrong about that in my view, but that would be Rawls's position. So isn't Sen's approach more focused on practical, whereas Rawls's idea is idealistic in nature? So again, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, Rawls's uh, approach is eminently practical. Uh, he does think about institutions as having a causal influence on people's lives. And he does want to undertake the task of reforming these institutions. That's how he thinks in the domestic realm. And what I consider to be his very best essay, the essay, The Basic Liberties and Their Priorities, is very much focused on that. So it is saying that we have a major injustice in our existing domestic institutional arrangements concerning in particular campaign financing and the way in which our political process works. And Rawls in detail gives you a plan for reforming that process. He didn't work with similar specificity on the opportunity principle and the difference principle. But I think that if we take this work, the basic liberties and their priority as paradigmatic, we can see what kind of work he would have wanted to do also in those other justice domains. So here's another question. It is not the case, is it not the case that institutional arrangements ultimately flow from the collective tensions dialogue across prevailing ethical frameworks at a given time in society, power, type of government, public administration, ETC, and hence would justice ultimately not become a function of the ability of particular social construct prevailing over another in terms of how it shapes the rules and institutional arrangements. So uh, I'm not sure whether that's meant to be a criticism or, uh, you know, of course it's true that uh, ideologies, if you like, or theories, uh, normative theories can have an influence on the way institutions are designed. But whether that is so or not may vary from case to case, from society to society. In the case of our international institutions, uh, there is some role of ideology, if you like, of normative uh, constructs in determining what these institutions are. But you might say that a much greater role is played simply by the distribution of power. You have uh, initially in the post-World War II period, you have overwhelming power concentrated in the United States and its allies, and they essentially shaped these supranational institutional arrangements, not so much according to their values, but according to their naked power interests. So in fact, that has been a major focus of my work saying that we, the West, that has dominated the shaping of supranational institutions, we have shaped these institutions contrary to our own values and rather much more in accordance with our own economic and political interests. Now there's another question, don't institutional rules, procedures also flow from certain institutions of privileging certain groups, particularly those who frame these rules? Well, in a way, yes. I mean, the institutional rules of a society include rules about how these rules are 
to be changed over time, how they are to be adapted to changing circumstances. And these meta rules, rules about the change of the rules, typically give those who are most privileged under the rules special powers to change the rules in their own favor. So you can see that uh, maybe a small example in the rules governing the operation of the World Bank. The United States has the dominant share of voting power in the World Bank and so is privileged in changing how the World Bank operates. Similarly, the permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations have important veto powers over how the entire UN system operates. So that's true that uh, these meta institutions are, uh, are an important aspect of the institutional order. I don't make a deep distinction between the rules and the meta rules. I consider the entire framework of rules to be one institutional scheme subject to this institutional moral analysis. Now, Rawls's view on Marx, uh, Rawls uh, thought very highly of Marx. So when he gave his uh, typical undergraduate lectures on political philosophy, Marx was a major part of these lectures, uh, devoted maybe three of the lectures of about 28 lectures in total, and about three of them were devoted to Marx. And he analyzed quite carefully uh, Marx's early writings, uh, also on alienation, and also his later work on the analysis of capitalism. And so I think he learned a great deal from uh, Marx. He would not have agreed with the labor theory of value, but he was definitely uh, his understanding of institutional moral analysis, precisely what I emphasized in the per first part of my lecture, was heavily influenced by Marx, much more so than by Weber and Durkheim and Pareto and the other thinkers who were co-responsible for the emergence of this mode of institutional analysis. So, I think I'm through to the end of the questions and maybe I go on with the lecture of Sony. Yes, I think we should get into the next part of the lecture. It's very good questions. Good. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to uh, pharmaceuticals that gives you a taste of how this institutional moral analysis can be applied at the global or supranational level and what results it might yield. So let me start with the status quo. The status quo is new. It came into existence in 1995 together with the World Trade Organization. In the founding treaty of this organization, you find uh, an annex 1C that is called the TRIPS Agreement, Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. This TRIPS agreement replaces a system where each country had its own intellectual property regime with a new arrangement where the whole world has the same intellectual property protections, namely 20 year product patents. That is the gold standard. Every country in the world has to have 20 year patents product patents. I tell you a little about India. India used to have seven year process patents. That is to say you could patent in India a particular way of making something, a particular process, and then clever Indian companies would invent around the patent. They would produce the patented product in a new way that was not covered by the process patent. In pharmaceuticals, that meant that India was the pharmacy of the world. Whenever a new medicine came onto the market, clever Indian companies would retro-engineer the pharmaceutical, 
would find a new way of producing it, of manufacturing it, and would then sell it all over India and all over the world at a low price, not in the developed Western countries because they had strong patent rights, but in the poor countries of the world, Indian pharmaceuticals were sold cheaply to everybody who needed them. That ended abruptly with the TRIPS agreement. India was given 10 years to adapt, but as of the 1st of January, 2005, 10 years later, India had to implement the new rules and in particular 20 year product patents that no longer made it possible for Indian generic manufacturers to invent around the new patented medicines. Now, this regime stimulates a vigorous R&D competition, but it also has severe drawbacks. And I will just mention three drawbacks. There are many more, but the three most important. The first one is that the TRIPS agreement, these 20 year product patents, they impede access to new medicines simply because innovators make money from marking up their product price, often by a very large factor. And then poor people cannot afford to buy the product. Let me give just one example. There's a new drug that came onto the market in 2013, which is called Sofosbuvir. Uh, the brand name is Sovaldi. It was marketed by a company called Gilead Sciences. This drug is for hepatitis C. It's a very important drug, very good drug, very important drug for the developing world. 70 million people in the world suffer from hepatitis C. That drug costs about $100 to make for a pack of 84 pills. That's how many you need, 84 days you need to take it to get rid of your hepatitis C. It came onto the market into the, in the United States at a price of $84,000. So the markup is one to a thousand or a hundred thousand percent. In India, you can probably buy it now for around $500, I estimate, maybe 35,000 rupees, something like that. But that is much, much cheaper than in the United States, but it's still very, very expensive in India for Indian poor people. So large markups impede access to medicines. Generic manufacturers are prevented from supplying the drug cheaply to the people who need it. Uh, and of course they could produce it, they could offer it much, much cheaper if they were allowed to do so, but they are not under the TRIPS agreement. Here you can see why the price is so high. Income in the world is very, very unequally distributed and the manufacturer or the, uh, I should say, the innovator, the pharmaceutical company will choose the price that is profit maximizing. So here you have a demand curve, the red curve. And what happens is, as you know, from economics 101, you choose a price on the left axis, you draw a straight line over to the red curve, then a vertical line down to the blue curve, and that rectangle is your profit. And if you want to maximize your profit, then you have to find the optimal price point. And if the curve is shaped like this, if it's very convex, then the optimal price point often is very, very high. You have a very high price. You serve 10 or 15% of the world's population and or the country's population and you forget about the others because if you lower your price you get more customers but you also lose a lot of your markup and so in the end you have less profit with a lower price than with a higher price so that's one drawback of the present system another drawback is that 
the TRIPS agreement misdirects R&D because you make a lot of profit by selling with very large markups, you simply don't care about those diseases where you cannot charge a large markup. Diseases that are concentrated among the poor are of no interest to pharmaceutical innovators because there you could not sell many copies at a very large markup. So these are diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, and so on. There are dozens of them, so-called neglected tropical diseases, which have received very little research attention. A third problem is that by rewarding innovations with patents and patent protected rewards markups, you are systematically disregarding externalities. You are focusing on the benefits of a medicine to the persons who use them, but you are disregarding the benefits to third parties. These benefits are enormously large in the case of infectious diseases. When you have a medicine for an infectious disease, for example, a vaccine for COVID-19, you are not only benefiting the person who is vaccinated, but you are also benefiting third parties who can no longer be infected by the person who is being vaccinated. These benefits are not rewarded because we make user-focused decisions about whether to buy a certain medicine or not. And the users typically care about themselves and not about the rest of the world. That means that there is too little research into communicable diseases and remedies against communicable diseases because the innovator typically cannot hope to get rewarded for the population effects of the medicine that they invent and then market. So there is underinvestment in the development of new pharmaceuticals that have high positive externalities. So now the question is, can we do better? Is there a better way to reward innovation in a way that does not have these drawbacks? And what I've been working on, what I'm proposing is a health impact fund that would allow innovators to be rewarded in a different way. The health impact fund is complementary to TRIPS and offers optional registration of any new medicine for participation in 10 consecutive fixed annual reward pools, each of which is divided among registered products according to their health impact measured in quality adjusted life years around the world. <clears throat> so innovators, those who create a new medicine they would have a new option, the option of registering their medicine with the Health Impact Fund. And they would then be entitled to participate in these annual disbursements for the next 10 years. Each year there is, an, is this disbursement of a large amount of money, which gets divided among registered medicines in proportion to their health impact they have achieved in the previous year. So to fix ideas, let's assume the Health Impact Fund has $6 billion available each year. So these are uh, $6 billion uh, are roughly 420 billion rupees. Uh, it's only 0.007% of the sum of all gross national incomes. And this contribution from states would be offset by large savings on registered medicines. Medicines would be much cheaper. We would save money on other healthcare costs because there would be much less disease in the world. There would be large gains in productivity because people would be healthier. 
and of course, gains in consequent tax revenues. So we think the health impact fund would pay for itself many times over. Now, registrants would be allowed to keep their intellectual property rights, but they would be required to sell the new medicine at the lowest feasible average cost of manufacture and distribution. In other words, the medicine would be sold at no more than manufacturing cost. The medicine would always be extremely cheap. I told you with the hepatitis C drug, it costs less than $100 to, to produce this whole course of treatment. And if you produced it, manufactured it in India, it would probably be even much cheaper. So drugs would be cheap. You would only pay the manufacturing cost no more than that, maybe even less as I will show in a moment. Now let's systematically look at the features and virtues of the health impact fund. First and foremost, as I said, there would be this dual optionality. The health impact fund is optional for innovators. So each product has a choice whether to go on the health impact fund and be rewarded that way, or whether to stay with the patent system and be rewarded with high markups. It would also be optional for funders. Each country would have the option of participating, contributing money to the health impact fund, 0.02% of GNI, or not to contribute money to the health impact fund and stay outside. This makes it much easier for the health impact fund to be established because we don't need to wait for all the countries. We just start with the countries that are willing to participate at the beginning. Second, the health impact fund exemplifies de-linkage. So we are de-linking the cost of innovation, the large cost of bringing a new medicine onto the market from the price of the medicine. The price of the medicine reflects only the manufacturing cost not the cost of developing the medicine in the first place. That cost, the cost of innovation, is covered from the health impact fund, which is something that states together fund. So we cap the price and delink it from the fixed cost of innovation. The health impact fund pays for performance. You pay for how much health impact a particular medicine achieves. The more people are cured or treated with the medicine, and the more each patient benefits, and also third parties benefit, remember externalities, the more the innovator gets paid for its medicine. So we strictly pay for performance, of which diffusion is an essential part. The more people benefit directly or indirectly, the more of the health impact funds annual disbursement goes to that particular innovator. Here, the reward of the innovator does not depend on whether patients are rich or poor, whether patients are willing to pay a lot or a little, but rather it depends on an objective measure of value. Every human being's health is valuable and equally valuable. We measure how much health impact the medicine achieves and we pay the innovator on that basis. Contributions to the health impact fund to these annual pools of money are to be made in proportion to countries gross national income. So the richer a country is, and the more populous a country is, the greater its contributions <coughs> to the fixed cost of innovation. This is exactly what we have now. Currently, the cost of innovation are borne by early users, by the people who use the medicine during the years that it is still 
under patent. We would do the same thing. It is the rich people who can afford medicines, rich people who are contributing the most to the health impact fund, rich countries. But the big difference is that the poor can participate from the beginning because the medicine is sold at a price that has nothing to do with the innovation cost. And so from the very first day, even poor people can afford to buy any new medicine. The Health Impact Fund involves competition. So different innovators compete for the pools, for the annual reward pools. And the principle of the competition is health impact. If you can achieve 8% as much health impact as all the registered products together, then you get 8% of the money in a given year. If you can achieve more health impact, you get more of the money. And of course, all the participating pharmaceutical companies and innovators will each try to achieve as much health impact as possible. They will try to save as many lives as possible, improve the health of as many people as possible, in order to get as large a slice as possible of the annual pools. So competition plays a big role in motivating innovators to achieve as much health impact as possible. And that means also to reach as many patients as possible. Now you may ask, what is the reward rate in the health impact fund? How much money do innovators get for each unit of health impact achieved? The answer is, that's an open question. It is not decided by us, but it's decided by the competition itself. So the health impact funds reward rate is self adjusting. If the innovators find the rate to be unsatisfying, unattractive, then few innovators will register their products. And that means the rate will go up because there are few products competing for the pool. On the other hand, if the innovators find the rate attractive and say, oh, that's good money, we want to register a product, then you get more registrations and the reward rate will go down. So the reward rate always adjusts itself so that it is found just right from the point of view as innovators. Innovators are not exactly happy with the rate, but they say, this is a good rate. We are willing to work for this rate. If the rate becomes higher than that, new innovators jump in and register products. If the rate goes below that rate, then innovators stay away, registrations dry up, and the rate again adjusts itself upward. Knowing this fact, both contributors, the states, and also innovators are always assured that the reward rate will remain at a reasonable level. It will never go very high and it will never go very low because of this self-adjusting feature. Now, what happens with non-contributors? What happens with states that say, we want nothing to do with the Health Impact Fund, we will not contribute? Well, if they are rich states, affluent states, then we will say to them, sorry, but you will not get the cheap medicine. The innovator will remain free to patent their product in your country, and you can pay a very high price for the product. So you will not get the benefit of the Health Impact Fund. We want to say that only to affluent countries, but in the poor countries, the medicine will be cheaply available even if the country does not contribute. This exception for rich non-contributing countries reduces the opportunity cost of registration. So the innovator can say, even if I register my product, I still keep my 
high prices in Japan or in the United States because they don't participate in the health impact fund. So I don't lose as much of an opportunity as I would if I had to sell it everywhere in the world at a very low price. And also there is now an incentive for non-contributing affluent countries to join the funding coalition, the funding partnership for the health impact fund. The people in the US or in Japan, they will say, oh my God, why do we pay such high prices for these medicines and everybody else pays a low price? Let us also join the health impact fund so that we can also get to enjoy the low prices that the health impact fund makes possible. Now, over time, the health impact fund can become bigger and bigger. I told you it might start with $6 billion, but we can make it larger. And that means it would take up a larger and larger percentage of the new medicines that come onto the market. This enlargement of the health impact fund can happen in different ways. First, there's economic growth in the partner countries. If they pay 0.02% of their GNI into the health impact fund, that would be a larger and larger amount. There could be the accession of new countries, new countries coming into the health impact fund. And there could be an agreement to raise the contribution percentage from 0.02%, maybe to 0.03%. Now, when that happens, when the fund gets larger, it becomes more and more efficient. Because as more countries join the health impact fund, then we would have more and more people benefiting from it. And we would also have more and more medicines supported by the health impact fund. So if the health impact fund doubles its contributing countries, it will quadruple its effect. The effect will go up by a factor of four because you double the number of beneficiaries, the number of people who benefit because we now have twice as many countries. And you also double the number of drugs, the number of pharmaceuticals that are supported by the Health Impact Fund because you have more money with which to pay the rewards. Now think about how the Health Impact Fund would change the motivation of innovators. Under the present regime, innovators are jealous spies. They are looking all over the world. Is anybody copying my innovation? Is anybody in the world taking my product, my innovation without my permission, without my earning a big markup on the product? So pharmaceutical companies are constantly running around the world trying to find any manufacturer that is illegally producing their product, any patient who might illegally be taking their product at a lower price. The Health Impact Fund would completely reverse that. So with the Health Impact Fund, I want everybody to take my product. I want my product to be distributed cheaply and easily so that everybody can take it and there can be as much health impact as possible. I want as much impact as I can achieve because that's what I'm being paid for. I'm paid for achieving health impact, making the health of people better. I want my product to be used widely and I want it to be used optimally so that each patient gets the optimal benefit and we get the optimal externalities, namely suppressing infection, getting the disease that I'm attacking, shrinking that disease, slashing that disease as much as possible. For that reason, I will promote my medicine very differently. I will even be willing to subsidize it, to sell it below manufacturing costs to very poor people 
because if I reach these people, I will achieve so much extra health impact that I make more money from the additional health impact than I lose from the subsidy. So I will promote the medicine and try to reach people in particular, even the very poorest people, remote people, because that enhances the health impact. One other feature that is different from the status quo is that pharmaceutical companies will learn to think strategically. In the moment, pharmaceutical companies say that we are in charge of inventing the medicine and maybe producing it. But then afterwards, somebody else takes over, wholesalers and so on. But under the health impact fund system, pharmaceutical companies would think about the entire pipeline from the workbench, from the research laboratory, all the way to the end users, because ultimately what you get paid for is health impact in the end users. So pharmaceutical innovators would think strategically, how can I most effectively suppress the target disease, get rid of that disease, make it as small as possible, achieve as much health impact as possible. Here, the profit of pharmaceutical innovators and the value are aligned. The innovators are paid exactly for what is morally valuable, namely to avoid and avert as much disease as possible. Under the present system, the two come apart and pharmaceutical companies are always accused. You're putting profits over people. You are withholding your medicine. You're pricing it out of reach of the majority of human beings. You are not doing research on the most important diseases, on malaria, on schistosomiasis. Uh, and profit and value go in opposite directions. Under the health impact fund, the two are aligned and nobody would be very interested anymore whether pharmaceutical companies put profits over people or people over profits, because either way, they do the same thing. Seeking profit is to seek health impact, it is to try to help everybody in the world, try to shrink the disease as effectively as possible. That is what gives you the profit. The Health Impact Fund would make the whole business of pharmaceutical innovation much more cost effective. First and foremost, by the fact that when a new medicine comes onto the market, everybody who needs it would quickly get it. Remember sofosbuvir, the hepatitis C drug, I told you there are more than 70 million people who have that disease. How many people eight years after the new drug came onto the market, how many people get the new drug? About six or 7% get the drug. After eight years, 94% of the human population with uh, hepatitis C are still without the drug because they can't afford it. So that is very, very inefficient. We take all the trouble of developing a new drug and then most people who need it don't get it. With the Health Impact Fund, every single person who needs that drug would get that drug because it would be cheap and because the innovator would be very, very eager to bring it to every last person because the innovator gets paid for health impact, gets paid more money for reaching poor patients than these patients have. The patient doesn't have that much money, but the Health Impact Fund has money to reward the innovator for reaching even remote and very poor patients. The innovator gets paid as much money for reaching a very poor person as it gets for reaching a very rich person. All human beings have the same value. So much more cost effective because we would reach everybody and we would tackle the big diseases of the poor, which currently get very little or no research attention. 
That means with the pharmaceutical sector being much more cost effective, we can have a triple win. So when you ask who is gonna pay for achieving more health impact, my answer is nobody's gonna pay for that because the system is so much more cost effective that everybody can benefit. We can have a win-win-win situation where patients benefit, human health will be much better, innovators will benefit, we can pay them as much or more for their innovation activity as they are now getting, and states can also benefit. Yes, they put money into the health impact fund, but they get more money back because of better health of their populations, uh, higher economic activity, higher tax revenues, lower hospitalization expenses, and so on. So this is really an institutional reform that I would call a no-brainer, but unfortunately, a lot of people are still opposing it. And I don't really want to be impolite and call these people brainless, but we have to get this reform going. We are working now on a pilot to which I think the Indian government, as well as the US government and several other governments will hopefully contribute. This is my last slide. The Health Impact Fund is a meta innovation. It's an innovation in how we innovate, in how we incentivize and reward innovation. And it doesn't work only in pharmaceuticals, it works in many areas of innovation. For example, it also works in green technologies. In green technologies, we have the same total stupidity. We are not rewarding for externalities. So let's say you have a choice to make whether to install a green technology in your factory. Now, the benefit for you is very small, very small. You breathe a little better air, but 99.9% .9 of the benefit of your using that green technology goes to strangers, distant strangers, and future generations. So often you will say, I will not pay for this. I will not buy this green technology especially because this green technology is expensive because it's patented and the patent holder will say, you can use it only if you pay me a large amount of money. Now that's completely stupid. What we should say is that once a green technology has been invented, everybody should be allowed to use it for free without a licensing fee, without any penalty. And what then do we tell the innovator? How do we reward the innovator? Because we want new green innovations to be invented. Well, we say to the innovator, you get rewarded from a green innovation fund that is funded or financed by states where states put money into the fund and reward green technologies, new green technologies in proportion to their environmental impact in proportion to how much emissions they avert, how much pollution they avoid. And if we did that, then we would have more important green innovations and each green innovation would diffuse much better. Everybody would be able to use it because there would be no licensing fee, there would be no cost of using the innovation, even though it's new. Anyway, I won't get into the details of the Green Impact Fund or the Green Agriculture Fund, uh, sorry, the Agricultural Impact Fund or the Educational Impact Fund. We've just discussed pharmaceuticals, so you get the general idea. And I close here and we can discuss this whole reform a little more. Obviously, the main point is that human rights in the world would be much better fulfilled if we had the Health Impact Fund instead of just the existing patent regime. 
which systematically hampers the diffusion of innovations and systematically shortchanges innovation in those diseases that have high externalities and predominantly affect poor populations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Poge. We have quite a lot of questions here. Uh, I will try and group some of them. Uh, and that may be the best way to handle because there are too many questions. Yeah, and I will uh, stop screen sharing perhaps. Yeah. Uh, first set of questions are about the uh, how health impact fund may have a competition with industrialists and profit maximizers who will have an entirely different type of markup. Uh, this question also is connected to the questions on uh, generic medicines and generic uh, drug producers. Uh, again, these two questions are connected uh, to the question on health impact fund. What, what will they do with the, uh, these two types of uh, medicines? Um, uh, that is first set of questions. Maybe you could take them, then we could come back. Yes. So uh, th there would be basically, there would be two parallel systems. There would be one system of medicines that are funded through the health impact fund. They would be very cheap and they would predominantly be for the large infectious diseases that are concentrated among poor people, right? In, uh, and other diseases, for example, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, they would remain under the existing system. They would, there would be patents and uh, they would be sold, the medicines would be sold at very high prices. Uh, as the health impact fund becomes larger and larger, as we hope it would, more and more medicines would migrate from the traditional patent reward system to the health impact fund system. And that means that we would get more and more registrations. At the beginning, we would have with $6 billion per pool, we would have roughly 20 medicines, 20 pharmaceuticals would be there in parallel. Every year, two pharmaceuticals would join and two pharmaceuticals would go off. That is a relatively small fraction of all the pharmaceuticals that come onto the market each year. Only two would go on the health impact fund, but they would be the most important ones. They would be the ones for the large diseases that are prevalent in the developing world. So they would be very important ones. Now, when you ask about competition, of course it can happen and it will happen sooner or later that there will be one health impact fund registered medicine for a disease where you also have patented medicines. So for example, imagine that you have a disease like diabetes, there are eight good drugs already on the market. They are sold at very high patent protected prices. And now the ninth medicine comes along and says, no, we are not gonna go on the patent regime. We are going to go on the health impact fund. And we are catering to the poor people in the world who may not have access to good diabetes medicine. If that happens, then of course, uh, they will dramatically undersell the existing drugs for uh, diabetes and those drugs will lose their market. And if that happens, well, tough luck, that's capitalism for you. Uh, you can charge high prices if you want, but nobody will guarantee you that you will not be undersold. So I don't foresee something like that happening in the near future because in the near future, all the innovations that the Health Impact Fund would reward that would be registered would be for poor people infectious diseases. But in the long run, uh, that could certainly happen at some point. Now about generic manufacturers. Generic manufacturers play a very important role in the Health Impact Fund because uh, they will be the ones manufacturing these very large quantities of drugs that would be needed to optimally distribute 
these new medicines that could come onto the market. So the pharmaceutical innovator has a new drug, let's say for malaria. The pharmaceutical innovator then puts out a tender and says, who can manufacture large quantities for me of my new drug? Different manufacturers would offer to produce and the pharmaceutical innovator would choose those manufacturers who offer the lowest reliable price where you have good quality production and a good price. The innovator would then sell the product at that same price, the price that it is being charged, let's say by a Serum Institute in India. So you would buy it at that price from the manufacturer and you would sell it at the same price to patients. And so you would make no profit at all on selling the product, but you would get rewarded, the innovator would get rewarded for the health impact that the drug achieves. So generic producers, manufacturers, the large manufacturers in which India has, has many and important ones, they would play the role of supplying the drugs because pharmaceutical innovators are not equipped to produce and cannot produce uh, cost-effectively these very large quantities. India is much, much better able to deliver large quantities of pharmaceuticals than anybody else in the world, frankly. Okay, a second set of questions is about uh, is pharmaceutical products or the drugs is the main problem? Is it not the infrastructure for the health a main problem? And therefore, how do we call this as a low hanging fruit? That's the second set of questions. Yeah, so uh, I find that, uh, you know, this whole talk about what the main problem is, uh, is a little silly, right? There are several barriers that prevent poor people from being supplied with the medical care that they need. And we have to get rid of all these barriers. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry always talks that way. They say, oh, the main problem is the health infrastructure <clears throat> in poor countries. And that means that our barrier that we put up, the price barrier, these ridiculous high prices, they don't matter, they don't make a difference. And of course they make a difference. I mean, imagine you have a person who is fenced in, right? You have that person locked up and you have him locked up in a room where the door is locked. And then you have the building and the door is locked also. And then the guy who has locked the door of the room says, oh, it's not my fault. You know, there is the real problem is that the building is locked up. And the guy who locked up the building says, oh, no, 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 it's not my fault. The real problem is that the room is locked up. That's a very silly debate. We have to get both doors unlocked for poor people to get access to medicines. And if we can unlock the first door, if we can say we have now got medicines available at very low prices that will help treat the diseases of the poor. We also solve much of the second problem because pharmaceutical innovators want their medicine to be effective. And if poor health infrastructure is a problem in many places, which it is, of course, pharmaceutical innovators will try to help solve that problem. They will say, for example, why is my medicine, my medicine is cheap. It is on the market in Uttar Pradesh. Why is it not reaching people in Uttar Pradesh? Why are people not benefiting from my medicine as much as they could? Well, maybe there's something wrong with the health infrastructure in Uttar Pradesh. Well, then we will go there. We will try to help, we will invest. Are there not enough refrigerators? Okay, we will donate some refrigerators. Is there not enough training of do the ashas maybe not know who needs to take that medicine or how it needs to be taken? Well, we do a course with the ashas. We tell them how this medicine is taken for optimal effect. So pharmaceutical innovators 
will suddenly become allies in the fight for better health, even of poor people. In the moment, pharmaceutical innovators don't care at all for people, for poor people. Poor people are not relevant to them because they can never buy our medicine. So why, do, why should we care? The CEO of Novartis a few years ago famously said, India has 50 million customers. India has 50 million customers. What does that mean? There are 50 million people in India who can afford to buy patented medicines. I'm sorry, India has 1.4 billion people and all of these people matter. All of these people need to be supplied. And I want pharmaceutical companies to think of every single Indian person as a customer, as a possible profit center. And that's what the Health Impact Fund achieves. And if there's any barrier between my medicine and any Indian customer, I want to know about that barrier and I want to participate in removing that barrier to achieve better health infrastructure and to make my medicine reach, effectively reach people all over the country. Uh, we have probably eight minutes left. Uh, maybe there are far too many questions, but a range of questions are about your views on how do we reconcile between the ideas of human justice, social justice and human rights on the other side and market on the other side. And since it is a, what you are proposing is a market based solution. Many of the questions are also asking does that mean we have given up the communitarian ideas uh, or uh, the ideas or state-centric ideas? So that is something which is reflected in the question of, will you, are you hopeful to succeed uh, the Health Impact Fund in the current paradigm? Yeah, so uh, the Health Impact Fund makes use of market mechanisms. The Health Impact Fund, if you like, creates a market. There's a new market for innovation where you have competing innovators trying to sell their innovation, if you like, right? They're bringing their innovation onto the Health Impact Fund market and they're competing for the limited fixed amount of money that is available on the Health Impact Fund each year, $6 billion each year. So it's a kind of artificial market, if you like. Now, every market is artificial in a way. Every market has rules. So for example, the ordinary capitalist market has rules. You can't trade human beings. Sorry, slavery doesn't exist. If you want to sell a human being, you cannot. Uh, or uh, patents, right? If you want to sell a medicine that is under patent, you cannot. You cannot make that medicine. You cannot sell that medicine. So the existing pharmaceutical market is also a market that is artificially constrained. So what we are doing with the Health Impact Fund is we are creating a new kind of market, a market that tries to align what is valuable with what is being rewarded. And I think every market should do that. Every market should be designed so that what gets rewarded is what is really valuable. The reward should correspond as closely as possible to what is of value. So I think that it is entirely stupid and fruitless to preach to the pharmaceutical companies, which is what most people today are doing, <clears throat> right? We go to the pharmaceutical company and we say, look, you guys are motivated by profit. You shouldn't be motivated by profit. You should be motivated by helping people. So instead of creating the 10th cancer drug, you should be creating a new malaria drug and so on. This is like preaching to the dog. The dog is standing in the middle of the room. You have a juicy piece of meat in one corner of the room and you say to the dog, please go to the other corner. You should be going to the other corner. No, that's not a very effective way of doing things. You should take the piece of meat and put it in the corner of the room where you want the dog to go. It's elementary, right? 
so long as pharmaceutical companies are rewarded the way we are now rewarding them, they will do what they are now doing. They will, they are responsible to their shareholders. They will not get money from the capital markets if they don't run a profitable business. That's what they have to do. And so instead of trying to make them do something that is not profitable, we should make it profitable for them to do what we want them to do. So I completely agree with where you are coming from as regards the purpose. And I'm just saying the right way to do it is to try to enlist these highly efficient companies that are really, you know, they could be very, very efficient. Companies can be extremely efficient, use them for the purpose that we want to be fulfilled. If you want parcels to be transported from one place to the other, you reward the person who does that, UPS or Federal Express or whatever it is, and they do a good job. If you want Coca-Cola drink to be available at remote corners in a refrigerated ice box, you pay somebody to do it and you get a very efficient system to do it. We just haven't arranged the pharmaceutical system in a way that efficiently produces what we want, namely health impact or health gains for poor populations. The health impact fund would achieve exactly that. Maybe with that, we should close. You have given quite a lot of your time and exceeded what we originally planned. That's what usually happens when we have exciting lectures as well as very excited audience who is willing to ask questions. Uh, I must really thank you for your time and patience and also uh, engaging with the uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Poki. Let me uh, also add the next lecture in the same series. I have just put that in the same chat box uh, that will be delivered by Professor Rajesh Sampath from Brandeis University. He's going to speak on roles and challenge of democracy in India. That also is next Thursday, exactly same time. So let us close this event. Uh, th thank you very much, Professor Bogey again, and to all the participants. Yeah, thank you for your good questions, and thank you for your good moderation and sharing. All the best. <laughs>